Now, that lion is either invisible to the naked eye and only visible through the damn cam, or he has walked off. And given the temperature, I suspect strongly that he's walked off. So if anybody did see him walk off, it would be most kind of you to tell me where he walked off to. That hippopotamus, of course, not alone. He has some friends you can see all around him in the form of about seven million catfish that are forming a sort of bed for him. Flapping about the place. Some of them will survive, of course, when it dries out. They'll go under the mud. They exude some sort of a, a slimy gel in which they stay relatively moist. I don't see any lion tracks on the road, but, I mean, given my tracking skills today, it wouldn't surprise me if we'd driven over him. So if you do know where he was or where he went, please tweet us, hashtag safarilifequestions at wilder.tv. I'm always amazed when I hear people read out terms and conditions, how fast they're able to do it. You know, this hippo is also not looking in the best of condition. You can see his hips are starting. Oh, He hasn't cleaned his teeth for a while either, has he, Davy? Mm -mm. No. Ugh. That is awesome. Isn't that fantastic? Apart from the fact that he's closed his mouth on about, well, goodness knows how many litres of mud. Fantastic. You can just see the swizzling, swooshing. All of those things that look like sticks there, everybody, are catfish. Every single one of them. Some of them are at least three or four feet long. They won't be able to... I'm just listening. I heard what sounded like an alarm call. But we'll go and have a look. See, you will also be able to hear the, I find, very comforting sounds of a camp going into the evening. Kimberlion, you want to know if you think the catfish provide a sort of soothing massage for the hippopotamus? I imagine they do, you know. I think it must be. Once you're used to the feeling, once you've got over the feeling of those uh, slimy things flapping against your body, it's probably, you know, if you just sort of let yourself into it, it's probably quite pleasant. Like when you put your foot um, in, in the mud... In a, in a sort of coastal river estuary and the fish start sort of swimming around it's a little, little uncomfortable and disconcerting to start with but after a while it becomes quite pleasant there are also two or three African jacanas or lily trotter birds around there's one coming just past the hippo there you saw there he is and he or she difficult to tell from here, will be just looking for little bit, little invertebrate snails, uh, possibly a little bit of algae, but largely snails, and maybe tadpoles if you can find them, but I don't think there are going to be many tadpoles in here. That's the last deep bit of water in this massive, massive water body. So... Definitely in for tough times here if you happen to be a hippopotamus. I was just saying the comforting sounds of the camp, of course. These camps come to life round about now. Everybody sort of coming back from the staff village in their pristine service outfits. And I always found it such a lovely time in the camp when I wasn't out in the bush. Carolyn, very nice question, an obvious one, of course, which I possibly should have addressed initially. Uh, what or how do hippopotamus keep cool when there is no water? And the answer, Carolyn, is they don't. They have to have water. They can try and lie in the shade. Sometimes they try and lie in the shade 
but they really have to have water to survive. They cannot survive out of water and you know there are fairly large areas of the Kruger where the hippo have been dying and uh, many hippo have died as a result of the lack of water around the place. So yeah, they have to have water Carolyn. So it's really a difficult time for them. And he's opened his mouth again. Here you can see his impressive nostrils. Look, look at that. That is very cool everybody. He's obviously a bit bored, he's scratching himself. He's been tickled by those catfish for too long. Stephanie, you say, would the hippo eat the greens in the pond? Uh, yes, they do sometimes. It's not ideal forage. It's an exotic thing called the water hyacinth. And I have seen the hippo here eating it. But I don't think they do it out of choice. I think they do it more out of desperation than choice. They really do need grass. That's what they're designed to eat. But they will eat it in desperation. And I think he's probably got to the stage where he eats quite a lot of it these days. You also find... With a lot of plants that aren't necessarily supposed to be eaten by the, the animal, so if an animal starts to eat plants that it's not really supposed to eat. Just listen to oh, what, oh, it is nice, never mind. I've just been listening to some jacanas, wondering what they were. Um, what you find is that eventually the sort of compounds in that plant, which are its defensive mechanisms, which might not affect the animal trying to eat the plant initially, after a while, they do start to create a bit of a problem. And it's the same as if you eat too much of one thing, you start to not want that thing anymore, and that's your body's, it's not, it's not psychological, it's your body telling you that it's had enough of whatever is in there and it needs something else. And I think that would be much the case with the water hyacinth. <laughs>